Where's my mouse? I gotta wait for it to hover over something. Oh, because it's stop share. All right, now, so we are live on several channels. Let's see how many people show up. Yeah, you got uh, Twitch. We've had got pretty Twitter. good turnouts. Um, I've been surprised. Nice. So let me open up a chat window. So I do an aggregated chat. So YouTube, Twitch, Mixer, um, Facebook, okay. all that chat goes to one place. Oh, nice. What tool is doing that? It's uh, Restream.io. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's a really nice tool. It works really well. Uh, the only problem is it adds a couple seconds of lag mm. for the process. So if you ask a question to the audience, it might take five seconds for anyone to see it and then for someone to respond. Gotcha. All right. I got to do better lighting in here. I got to order that lighting kit because it's like the down lights just make me, it's like, even if I take the hat off, it's not any better. <laughs> just my glaring forehead. Oops. Drop my remote. All right. So YouTube is working. That's good. Awesome. Very good. Very nice. All right. Does it look like mission control in there? Like six or seven screens? And <laughs> it's. <laughs> I uh, the, the, go, no, go for recording. <laughs> so I do the the reverse. So I got a TV uh, up on the screen. I like it. And I don't have my light on, but it, that comes in really handy during the live stream because I can at least see what the lag is. Yeah. Because I'll do something like, all right, I'll wave my hand, and then <laughs> I'll stare at the screen. Hand waves. Yeah. You know. How many seconds it takes for me to wave my hand, and I still haven't done it yet. Uh, any minute now, any minute now. Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite laggy, like 10. Oh yeah. You're talking like a 10, 15 second lag. Um, okay. Good to know. So good to know. All right. I was telling the folks in, uh, B biz. I'm like, all right, John's coming on. You should go home and get in front of your computer and come watch. Like, oh, yeah, was, 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 uh, Mike, like, I've already seen that. <laughs> yeah, Mike said, I've already seen it. It was good. Uh, I'll watch it again. Uh, Ryan was there and he said, you know, I'll put it on for some background noise. That's Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> I don't think he's watching yet, so it's all right. All right. Um, oops. How good does, there's only one or two little pieces, but how good does uh, video play back across this? Kind of like jumpy? No, it should I, I'm trying to remember if we played a played a full video back. Um, it should work. Yeah, it should work. All right. I'm gonna let's see. Pause this. I'm just turning off anything that'll take up bandwidth or make my machine laggy. <laughs> yep, I do the same. Actually, I haven't done that yet. That is a good good point. Let me do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right let's see if we get any comments about all the keyboards on the on the wall behind you <laughs> I, get, I get numerous um the band always gives me crap because they're like you should uh I, I think it's rick rick wakefield or rick, rick wakeman that was um i don't know he was some 70s keyboards but he'd always be like playing keyboards like this he had a cape. It was crazy. Uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't even have the talent for one like directly in front of me. I'm like, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can do two if I'm looking at them, but this whole thing, unless I'm holding note here and not having to move my hand, I'm like, yeah, I can look. Now I can look. But no, I usually, usually all of those are actually triggered from a keyboard uh, right in front of me, in front of the computer. And they're just yeah. like, they're basically sound modules on the wall. Um, I, on, on occasion, I'll stand up and play one. Depends on if somebody's, you know, I'll have people come over sometimes. We'll work on a jam or something. Like we just did the, um, I don't know if you saw, you know who Josh Garrels is? No. 
Christian artist out of Ohio, and like like the uh, our our guy here does a lot of um, like he does a lot of production work. He was out in New York, and he does he does really good stuff. And it doesn't have a lot of those like sometimes where you're like, oh god, this is a horrible song, and in, in you know the praise team kicks it in. But like this, uh, we, he came over and we were sitting there just like he he basically was like, do that Brian Eno noise thing you do. I'm like okay, and so I'm like standing up there and I'm doing this on two keyboards, trying to get a weird patch going at the same time, and you know just doing an ambient underscore track on, on some of the songs. It was fun. Nice. My, uh, the extent of my keyboard knowledge is, um, so my wife plays piano and stuff in our praise band and I'll go over and I'm like, all right, middle C. <laughs> all right. Found that. I'm good. <laughs> good start. All right. It's like, I, I think that's half the battle is just finding middle C. And then it's like, um, oh. I can play the, the beginning of Ode to joy or something. <laughs> it's like, all I'm right. That's the extent we, of my we knowledge. We started with the kids doing uh, lessons. Our oldest is six, and the second one's four. Uh, and so, you know, they can do like the, the oldest can do "Twinkle Twinkle" with help, um, and that's about it. But it's it's still like, you know, I didn't start piano until I was six, and I'm look at me now. I have a I'm, a, I'm an, addict, uh, an addict, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's you just need that first hit, right? First, you hit do three, right. And then... Just a little man, just yeah. a little. Give me that Beethoven. <laughs> we did uh we did a two frugal dudes episode uh last week and uh the person who was on she was a recovering drug addict and oh, wow. uh paid off out her debt like she completely turned her life around and awesome. so towards the end we were talking about dave ramsey and i'm like not even thinking i go well a lot of people say uh dave ramsey is the gateway drug to personal finance and it's like oh that might not have been the best thing to say <laughs> in that moment um uh, but she had, she got a laugh out of it. She's like, "Yeah, you're absolutely right." <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, it's like, oh, it, it, it comes out of your mouth, and immediately the guy in the back of your mind's like, "Wrong, nope, yep, bad." <laughs> in any other circumstance, that would have been hilarious, but not this time. All right, how are we doing? Got some folks out there. I see about five, six people watching. So more coming in right at two o'clock. We sent emails out. So just about an hour ago. So hopefully some folks come from that. So if you're out there watching live, say hi in the chat, no matter what chat you're in, we see it all. Sorry. Our, our landline is, uh, I don't know if you hear that coming across, but it's the, uh, can't come the phone. The right scammers now. and the political people have started calling in, in full effect. Sorry, I can't come on the phone right now. If this was important. Send me a text message. Well, and it's also it's like it's an eight hundred number and it's like not provided. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't need to talk to you. Yeah. All right. So I just booked my first flight to London. I saw. That's uh, gonna be awesome. When I is am, the conference? It's in January, late January. Nice. Do you have your um, talks so on yet? What's that? You have the talk done? No, no, no. Uh, I have to have it done for November. So oh. I have to work on it anyway. And I'm working on some ways to engage the audience after the talk. Um, nice. So I'm, I'm trying to create a real process for this because the, the conference I'm going to, I'll probably have a couple hundred people in the talk. Oh, I want to make sure I can take advantage of an audience that size totally. um, the best way possible. So yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, but the one of the guys I'm going with, uh, who also got selected, he he goes to the UK several times a year. Like he's he is my American friend who knows London or the U, well, just England, Scotland, Ireland all better than probably a lot of locals do. Oh, um, right. So I asked him, "All right, when do we go? What do we do when we get there?" Like. <laughs> Um, and like to the point where he just sent me the flight plan. He said, these are the flights we're booking. <laughs> like, he just knows it all. Um, <laughs> and I went to look up the same flights myself. And somehow what I looked up was six, $700 more expensive Whoa. than what he sent me. And I swear I was looking up the same time. So I just went with his plan and yeah, yeah we're flying up on a Friday and, uh, coming back the next Saturday. So I'm going to spend a, a oh, good nice. solid week there. Uh, I'll do a 75 minute talk somewhere in between. Uh, but the rest of the time I'm just going to kind of explore and be tourist and yeah. just have fun. 
are you just going to be in London or are you going to go up uh, up north a bit? I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have not been given my itinerary for the week. That's all. You have a built-in tour guide. That is that is yeah. pretty awesome. Pretty hard to beat that. He's going to take me into a lot of the the small villages because uh, he has people that work in the UK, and oh, okay. he's going to take. He knows all the villages. He knows the good local pubs. Um, no, we're going to go have some fun. I'm looking forward to it. Just remember, if they ask if if you want your your vegetables British or or not, not. <laughs> not british okay british british steam and they they destroy vegetables in 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 cooking them and they're like mush um and we we were there and i stayed with a friend up in sirencester we, we went there during our free week for architecture school and it was just like she asked me that i'm like yeah whatever's fine wrong answer <laughs> all right. she, like she even knew she knew like you're not gonna like this oh man all right well i will keep that in mind uh, we have some folks in the chat, so shout out to Ryan from Denver uh, and Joel Cochran uh, from Harrisburg, Virginia. He's not that far away from you. No, just over the mountain. Yep. All right, well, we're right at 2 o'clock. We might as well get started, uh, have some respect for everyone's time. So I'm going to hit record. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Swift Kick Show. We are back again with another great presentation today. I'm joined by my good friend, Jonathan. How are you, John? I'm well. How are you doing? Good. Did I say your last name correctly? I always... Yeah, you got it. I got All right. I have been practicing, so... <laughs> <laughs> because I hate screwing that up. All right. So, John is... This is your second time on the show. Yep. Uh, I forgot what you talked about last time, but... It was a very long time ago. Did we do Timeless um, Way of Building? or Yes, I think you did. Yep, that sounds familiar. Uh, and you, so you just did this talk not too long ago at Revolution Conf. You're wearing the shirt. And the feedback I got from that talk is that it was very well received. A lot of people uh, loved it. A lot of people didn't get a chance to go to it who wanted to. So we thought that was just good fodder for a Swift Kick show and yeah. hopefully everyone involved. Um, so, John, you really don't need any other introduction. I know you have a lot of great stories in here, so I just want to let you get to it. Um, but anyone out in the chat, if you want to ask John questions, uh, just drop in the chat and I'll bring them up when appropriate. Uh, do understand we probably have a 15-second delay just with uh, the streaming software. So if I don't get your question in right away, it's probably because I didn't see it yet. Um, or you, you asked it in the past and I, yeah, <laughs> you know, time travel, we haven't perfected that yet. Right. Uh, but John, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'm going to go silent. All right, cool. Well, hello everybody. Um, today I'm going to speak about, um, building software like Pixar makes movies and you know, what good would any, any Pixar talk be if we didn't have a good little intro animation? So always got to have your trailer, right? Company launch. So what most people don't realize is Luxo Jr., who's bouncing on the eye right there, is actually one of the first pieces of animation that Pixar ever did, uh, and they won a short. It was they won a um, an Oscar for the short. So as we get into this, we're going to start seeing how they've used these shorts and ideas and sketches not only to drive their software and hardware, which is a very large part of the business, but also to make amazing entertainment, which is what most people are familiar with. So I'm uh, currently the VP of Design at Powerfleet. Uh, it's a, a now a worldwide organization, uh, about 800 people in, in the logistics and industrial truck space. Uh, I'm also a Rails programmer dabbling in Ember, Angular, and other JavaScript frameworks depending on the day. Uh, and I wrote this about almost a decade ago now. So um, it's horribly out of date. <laughs> but if you have questions about the Rails view, I'm always happy to discuss. And uh, I may bring it back in a blog form. We've had a bunch of people kind of start to push for what is the new world of the Rails view? So I come from 3D to the 3D kind of Pixar world from a really weird space. I have a master's in architecture of the building variety, not systems. Um, during architecture school, and this is in the late 90s, uh, I had uh, an immersive 3D design studio. Design studios are, are a six credit class and you're doing design projects in for buildings and other things like that. And what we ended up doing is everything you did from sketching to final presentation work was all done in the software. And at the time it was 3D Studio Max. So we spent a whole year doing this. Uh, and some of the things, you know, just at, this, at the time we're using like 133 megahertz Pentiums. I mean, this is lo like lo-fi compared to today. 
And um, so we're rendering small 640 by 480. I had a glass shot uh, and glass atrium. So a, a 10 second shot running up in a glass atrium took all of Thanksgiving break to render um, at 640 by 480. Now that would be, you know, an overnight at, at worst uh, and would look a lot better. Um, so <clears throat> that's my uh, master's. I did this for a, uh, I also did this for architecture firms when I came out, uh, I did this for RTKL. We did the Capital Visitor Center, the Pentagon reconstruction uh, and a bunch of other projects, Capital, all the, the, if you ever go to the US Capital area in DC, all these bollards all the way around, we did a whole bunch of uh, visualization for the Senate for that kind of stuff before they built it. Uh, one of the big things we did was the 2012 DC Olympic bid. They obviously didn't get it, but the entire front of this shot is fake. And uh, this made the front of the Washington Post, which is always, every, that's always a fun thing to have in your, your uh, archive somewhere. Um, so I've done this for a long time and, and ending up with, uh, we did this as meticulous for a long time. Most of this was doing UX and other things, but the 3D world, we did a lot of architecture consulting. And we also did a short in 2005. Uh, we produced it on laptops and a friend of mine from high school uh, was finishing up working as a compositor on the matrix. And he's been doing that, that world still to this day. Uh, and we even printed a 35 millimeter at the end. So it was actually projected on film and it went around the world for festivals. It's only five minutes long, but it's pretty impressive what we could do in 2005. Um, and it, it was good enough to impress Blue Sky Studios, which is Fox Animation. And the director came up with a concept at the time. They asked us to pitch a feature. We came up with the Kung Fu movie for kids. Head of production was really excited. She went to LA to go take it to Fox and get, get a green light and she gets off the plane front page of Variety, DreamWorks announces Kung Fu Panda. And Blue Sky Studios does not do competitive development. So competitive development is when two companies are making a similar movie. So A Bug's Life and Ants from Pixar and DreamWorks, for example, is competitive development. So that was that. Uh, he's been working on it on and off. It's dramatically different than Kung Fu Panda, which is the frustrating part, but he it, it's uh, it's almost something. I mean, he's been working in his free time, you know, between movies for a decade now. So it'll be out eventually. Um, so I love 3D. I love Pixar, uh, but I have one thing to tell you up front that I lied. This is actually not a talk about building software. This is a talk about how to manage creative endeavors, but software is a creative endeavor. So we're applying a lot of this to software, but it's, it's broader than that. This is not just that. So it's not a talk about uh, how to spend four years to get to a release uh, or to make software that has you crying 20 minutes in, but it's all okay by the time you get to the end. Um, and it's also not a software, a, a talk about how to have software with 47 minutes of silent interaction before you get somewhere. Right. So this is not just about creative people in the artist sense of the word. Uh, Pixar is made up of artists, managers, software developers, product managers, unit production managers, which would be like the, the PMO, project management office in, our, in the, the, the tech side of house and more. Uh, so we're going to break this down like any hero's journey or good Presbyterian sermon into three parts. We got uh, the history lesson. We're gonna go from 1972 up to the IPO and the release of Toy Story in 94, 95. Secondly, we're going to talk about people in candor and how some of the things that they've implemented there really push towards a very open environment. And then third, we're gonna talk about the physical space and how physical space can affect creative endeavors. So. Brief history of almost everything. I'm a sucker for origin stories, uh, and it's difficult to talk about some of this stuff because there's so much that happened before Toy Story that is fundamental to everything we do in computing today. So looking at early 70s, we're gonna start in 1972. This is Ed Catmull. Ed Catmull is now the soon to retire or just retired president of Pixar and Disney Animation. Uh, but at the time he was a computer science master's or a doctorate guy, uh, and he was working on stuff at the University of Utah. Um, and he is probably best known not only for bringing Pixar to the fore, but also about teaching Steve Jobs a lot about creativity management and how I feel he was one of the people that was most instrumental in, in Jobs' eventual return to Apple. And the things that he learned when he was away, a lot of the time was spent at Pixar, and he brought that back with him. Um, so University of Utah, Ed's there and he's working on various visual graphic stuff. And this is 1972. So why Utah? Utah was actually one of the original ARPANET nodes. So it's still a pretty, pretty cutting edge, you know, tech school, but uh, it's not something like people talk about like MIT. Um, but it's one of the original nodes on ARPANET and he is there and he's doing 
very early animation. So he is creating one of the first pieces of animation with is actually his left hand. Uh, now, this isn't the kind of thing we do now where you render the video and play it back on the screen. Everything here is coded by hand. All software, all written as vertices. It's printed frame by frame to a static image. Then those images are printed to physical film. And then then that can be projected. So we'll kind of catch it in here. Mm, love that typography. So <laughs> we're working through here. He's got a hand and you're gonna start seeing it rotate around. Uh, and, and what ends up being the, the amazing part here is that they worked through and figured out all this stuff. And they, they modeled, they created polygonal modeling to do this. So they drew, took the hand, the model of his physical hand, and they drew all these vertices and lines. And then they went through and they used a 3D digitizer, which is like a big XYZ cube with a pen. And they're actually going up and down and tracing every one of these shapes. And by doing that, the, that comes in as 3D mathematical data that they could then have the computer start working with. So this then becomes a wireframe. So that is the actual lines that were traced and cleaned up. And then they're going to, they animated this. So now we're starting to look about at other, some other complexities that you have in animation, which is called deformation. So when a hand goes in, your, your muscles and your skin is moving. But if you just do it without filming it, you end up with this weird, like pinching and crunchiness in the model. So here's the final model with smooth shading. And they, uh, that is shaded, which means they put a texture around it. So you can tell it still looks a little weird here, right? The hand finger, something's not quite right. But this is 1972. No one's done this before. So what the, uh, the things that are coming out of here that they've created now, we've got polygonal modeling and subdivision surfaces. So a surface where you can break it up and break it up and break it up again as the, the computer's calculating it. Um, and then they also did texture mapping. So being able to take and project a, te a texture onto a wireframe. And then the most important thing that you don't even think about that is used in everything you use, every computer chip, graphics chip has got this is Z-buffer, Z-depth. So when a computer is calculating occlusion, like my hand moving here, it's got to understand how far away that is. And then it's going to say, okay, I'm not going to render the stuff behind it while this is going in front of it to save render time. Um, and it's, it's one of those things, like things you don't even think about that were amazingly cutting edge in 1972 are now just the standard. I mean, every single video game you've ever played uses Z-depth and Z-buffer. Uh, and we'll see some examples of how, how that has improved over time. Um, so during this time, um, University of Utah sent Ed down to Disney in Los Angeles to pitch the technology and say, hey, look what we can do. We can animate in the computer. Uh, but they weren't interested. This, they were like, that's not animation. This was the nine old men. This is, you know, the, the, the heyday of Disney animation coming out of the 60s. Um, Snow White, 101 Dalmatians, Cinderella, all the classics. So <clears throat> this was some weird, funky technology. This was a parlor trick, uh, but they'll come around in about a decade. So 1974, he's finished up his graduate work and he goes to the New York Institute of Technology. Uh, he was 29 and he was brought in to create a team to make an animated movie of some kind. Uh, and so he starts going out and finding people that he knows through the network of computer science and grad school. And he brings in a gentleman called Alvy Ray Smith. And this is a recent picture. He was much younger back then. Um, and Ed Catmull is quoted as saying that Alvy could, you could swim circles around him technically, but um, and better suited to do his job. But the, his attitude was, well, I'm going to bring in the best people I can, and I will be the best manager I can be and I'll enable them to do the work. So instead of being intimidated by this, he just said, that's great. I'm going to get these amazing people and roll with them. So two things they invented here. Tweening is the, one of the ones that you don't even think about, but it's the most important. You've ever done CSS animation. You've ever done any kind of keyframe animation, flash, um, after effects, anything like that. Tweening is how it calculates between the keyframes what happens. Uh, ease in, ease out, all that is handled by tweening. So that's one thing. And then the second thing that's very important for things looking smooth is motion blur. We see with motion blur. Um, if you don't have it, it looks like the thing goes chump, 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 chump. So the motion blur gives you that nice smooth effect. Um, so that's when you pause a, a still frame that's filmed, you'll see, you know, there's like a blur. And then that's how do we emulate that in the computer? So 
some of the first learnings we have from Ed here is, you know, hire the best people you can possibly find and go really fast. 1977, you know, there's something important that happened here besides me being born. And I think you guys might know what that is. But, uh, you know, George Lucas basically debuted Star Wars and everything changed. The mental ability of like, where it was like, wow, we can do this now. This is a whole new world of computing. This is a whole new world of filmmaking. And Industrial Light and Magic, most of Star Wars was actually done old school. Um, they'd take an image and they would uh, film something and then they'd film another thing. They would cut out mats frame by frame. They'd project them over each other onto a new piece of film. This is called optical printing. And this right here is an optical printer they used in the early days of Industrial Light and Magic. Um, and, but like any photocopy, this creates artifacts over time. So the more times you go down the, the rabbit hole of, of each print, something they, things lose contrast. So like uh, a great example of this is the, uh, the parent trap with Haley Mills. One of the Haley Mills is always a little bit less contrasty than the other one. Just the nature of how the printing works in the camera. Um, <clears throat> so 40 years ago, this was still cutting edge. And this is the kind of stuff that was like, wow, we can do that now. Um, 1979, the team was hired by Lucasfilm. And New York Institute of Technology was like, we don't know what we're doing here. And Lucasfilm bought the whole team. So George brought everyone out to San Francisco, uh, Marin County. Uh, and this is what an edit table used to look like in film. So editing in film used to be very destructive. It used to be linear. Uh, they call things now nonlinear editors, but this was linear filmmaking. You would literally take the positive, scroll through, find where you wanted to cut, literally cut, tape it to the next piece of film, and that was the cut. And, that's, and then you would play that back. <clears throat> and finally, your master, where you've got all the pieces of tape, is printed to negative, and that's your master negative and then that goes out to, to the world as, as once it's printed out for copies. So the question George Lucas put to them is how can I use a computer to do this so I'm not having to reprint things over and over again because once you've cut the film you end up with a lot of tape if you want to move like hey let's make that a little longer okay let's find that piece let's boom and this is where the phrase cutting room floor came you know things left on the cutting room floor this is the cutting room. So they invented a thing called DroidWorks. Um, this is a later version of it, but it was uh, it was the, the first thing they'd ever done is like a nonlinear editor um, that you could go through and you've got these visuals of a rolled up piece of tape, a rolled up piece of film. So it's like literally the visual of being representative and a pair of scissors, you know? So this is UI design coming in from the real world. But um, when they first took this to the editors, the editors didn't want anything to do with it. They, uh, they didn't want to touch it. This was not editing. Um, so one thing we can think about as technologists when we're building software and building products is that big, big leap in technology requires communicating the vision. Like Lucas had told them, we want to build this, but he hadn't told the editors, this is where we're going and you're going to get on board with it. So you can test it, but at the same point, it's the, uh, the famous Henry Ford quote that he never said, which is the, uh, if I asked people what they wanted, they'd ask for faster horses. Um, and if you, if you have people that refuse outright to use your product, you obviously have a communication issue uh, in the first place. So as things are progressing here in the early 80s, uh, Lucas, they invent blue screen technology. So this is some work from Return of the Jedi here. Uh, but blue screen basically is called chroma keying. They enable somebody to take a picture and knock out a, a certain color. So in this case, it was blue. More recently, they moved to green because it doesn't have as negative an effect on skin tones. Um, but they also built a piece of hardware called the Pixar image computer. And the name from this came from the Spanish verb Pixar, P-I-X-E-R, which is to make pictures. And then the concept, the word radar, which is an acronym, but blend it together, Pixar. So it's a two foot square cube. Um, it has less computing power than an iPhone one. Uh, and at the time it was meant for really complex image processing. So it was a lot of it was, were sold into image facilities uh, like medical, medical uh, firms and hospitals, but they're only made about three to 500 of these ever. Um, so if you ever see one of these, grab it for me. I, I, I want to put it up on a shelf. It's, it's, it just looks cool. But uh, one of the, the things they invented here also is called um, Reyes. So Reyes is renders everything you ever saw. This is a picture called the Road to Point Reyes. Reyes Point Reyes is a location in the Bay Area. Um, and what's amazing about this shot is you're actually starting to see reflections, but the reflections like in the bottom right here are muddled. 
like you, there's wind ripples on that water and it's affecting the, the reflection. You've got transparency with the, the, the different rainbows. You've got <coughs> um, what we call sfumato or, or uh, the fog as you go in Z depth and into the picture, the horizon, things get more and more fogged out, more and more low contrast. Uh, and this is, that's, you know, that was something that Michelangelo did as a painting technique, and now they're figuring out how to replicate that in the computer. Some of the stuff still looks pretty 80s, you know, I mean, that's the, the nature of it. But this at the time, again, is cutting edge. And the first time you see this in film is the sequence from Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan, Star Trek II. Uh, and this is the Genesis effect. So everything you're seeing here is coming out of Reyes. <clears throat> um, so the whole, the planet, the stars, all the particle effects um, and you know the fractal growing of the ground coming up out of the water after we go through the fire plume. Um, all this was rendered in the computer. No one had ever seen anything like this before. So it's this is now just expected, right? If you don't have something like this in, in your movie, it's like you didn't use your, your visual effects budget very well, but that was cutting edge at the time. So again, the big, the big text coming out, the blue screen chroma key, nonlinear editing and Reyes. 1983, Disney has finally been like, okay, we need to figure out what we're doing here. And they come up to visit Lucas and see what's going on. So he's up in Marin County. He's an hour flight from Los Angeles, five, six hour drive, far enough away to not be bothered on a regular basis, but easy enough to get to. So one of the guys there is a guy named John Laster came up from Disney. So they hadn't had any major advances in tech since 1961 with 101 Dalmatians. So 20, 22 years, no big changes in how they were making animated films. Um, the famous nine old men were starting to move into management positions or, or just weren't present. So there was kind of a, a dull time for Disney animation. And John Laster basically sees this up on the wall and he apparently store, stared at it for 15 minutes and just fascinated with it. And just asking, how did you do this? What can we do with this technology? Just, he really wanted to know. So they go back down and they're, you know, they're doing development stuff. He pitches the concept for Brave Little Toaster and is fired later that afternoon. Uh, there's no telling if that had something to do with it, but they, he, he left Disney. And a few weeks later, Ed Catmull gives him a call because Pixar or Lucasfilm Digital Image Group at this point is trying to figure out how to show off this technology in a film, short film, at SIGGRAPH, which is a huge graphics conference that happens every year. Still, you can still go today. Um, and they, had, they were making a, a video called Wally and Andre B. And he's like, great, I'll be there tomorrow moves up to Marin County and, uh, and, and starts working on this with them. And so this is the, the digital image group from Lucas. You've got, you know, Alvy Ray there in the middle with the clicker and on, on our left is Catmull and on our right is Lassiter and the rest of the group there. Um, and so what this animated short is, is basically a, uh, a quick story about a guy that meets a bee and uh, is afraid of the bee and points at something and runs away and the bee stings him in the butt. And that's basically the whole thing. Um, but this is again, never been seen before. People had never done this kind of work before. And what's amazing about this is that when Lasseter comes in, the consensus is we don't have a story and I don't want to watch this. Like the, internally, the team had said that. They're like, we don't care. So coming up with that story that I just told you suddenly turned this into something that people wanted to, wanted to watch. Um, and SIGGRAPH at this point, the graphics you're seeing are like, here's a satellite flying by Saturn. All right, that's cool. But that was like, that was the extent of it. Um, so I'm going to watch through this real quick. And what happened in the actual presentation is they didn't have time to finish this. So this, this version has the full rendered final.
but somewhere in this point they switched to wireframe uh and and so you couldn't you couldn't see the full rendering because they didn't have time to render it but uh the story got across <laughs> and that's basically it so what this is what wireframe is this is basically what they had to resort to to kind of finish up the film but people were coming up the end being like that was so amazing they really didn't even re like yeah i went to wireframe but the story was what people were captivated with and that's what's important. And so this really goes to a great quote from Catmull, which is for all the, the care you put into artistry, visual polish doesn't matter if you're not getting the story right, or if you are getting the story right. Uh, and now developers, before you start thumbing your nose at your fellow design staff, that also means that awesome technology doesn't matter if you aren't getting the experience right. So experience can make, like a great experience can forgive technological mistakes. The other way typically doesn't work. People are not going to be like, woohoo, this is Node.js and amazing work in, 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 Elixir with the view front end. I'm so excited. Nobody cares. <laughs> we might care, but the user, like, I can't do X. I can't click on this thing because it keeps, like, it's not clickable. That's a failure. So 1985, uh, Lucas is going through a divorce and starts selling off assets. And one of those assets is the Digital Image Group. And it is sold to Steve Jobs, who is now at Next. He's been out of Apple for a little bit. Um, and uh, Jobs buys it for $5 million. And then he throws an additional five million at Catmull and says, "Go, go do R and D." And then he leaves him alone. Uh, and he's Jobs is thinking, you know, he's at Next, right? Next is like we're doing high end computers, so he sees the Pixar image computer as another high end computer that they're going to sell. Um, and so at this point, Pixar is a hardware and software R and D company. They're burning cash. Sounds like a lot of the places that we work that are are tech startups, right? Um, and so. You know, this is, remember, there are only like three to 500 copies of this thing that exists, and they're trying to figure out how to sell it. Uh, and at this point, Catmull is like realizing that this is not going to be the cash cow that Jobs thinks it's going to be. So they're trying to figure out ways of integrating, you know, how do we run the team better? How do we do things like this? And a lot of these things that come out are, are lean concepts, but some of the, the things that start to come to the foreground came from this gentleman, uh, Edwards Denning. So in the 40s, mass production, the mantra was never stop the line. Oh, the line has to keep moving. So uh, if you had a problem, you would pull it out of the line, but the line never stopped. And what this guy was in Japan working on reconstruction and he started working with Sony. And one of the things that they did was this total quality control concept, but it comes down to this. So everything, every employee is responsible for being able to keep the production line producing quality as opposed to um, just making sure it's always running. So anybody, could stop the uh, the cycle and say, hey, we have a problem. Uh, and then they would come over, look at what's wrong with the workstation, fix it and move it on. So uh, this you know worker engagement is huge. So every worker feels invested. They feel that they are responsible for that product. If their station messes up, then they're gonna be responsible for that failure as well. So these ideas came into, into the Valley with HP and Apple in the eighties, but it took a while. And so this is when this stuff is starting to get picked up in the States. So 1987, they're still doing R&D. They're improving the Reyes software, uh, which is, again, the military acronym, renders everything you ever saw. And they make Luxo Jr., 1987. They get an Oscar nomination, and it's uh, modeled after a uh, drafting lamp. And they had a drafting lamp on the desk. They modeled it, and the baby lamp is jumping along and jumping on a ball and things like that. Uh, the next year, they, they did a tin toy. And so... The baby basically, if you haven't seen it, destroys all these toys. That's the short of it. But you look into this, okay, the, the background, the room looks okay. Sofa looks okay. The toys look okay. Wow, that baby looks weird. Really freaky weird. So, but this, remember, this is early, early, early. This is 88. So we're doing, every single year, they're doing shorts and putting things together. And this has really become something that they have done forever now. So every 18 months or so now, they put out a new short film. Um, it's usually pushing technology. They're sometimes developing a story. Uh, a lot of times they're developing new directors. A lot of people that start as Pixar short directors move on to work on the feature side. Um, and so, I mean, if you think about this, the budget to make a five minute film is a lot smaller than a budget to make a 90 minute film. There's a lot less risk. And if you also are chalking it up to research and development, then it's like, okay, even if the, it fails, you know, we learn something from it, right? So what we can do here is small focus prototypes all the time. Um, paper, 
use something like Framer, Sketch, um, clickable prototypes. It doesn't need to have a line of code. You can go to that, but you don't have to. Um, test first, then build. So we save a lot of money. We save a lot of headaches. We save a lot of time. We fix the problems before we built it in code. So again, only 30 to 500 of these have been sold in 1989. Steve Jobs is kind of like doubting himself at this point. He's gone a bunch of times. He's tried to sell Pixar, but can never go through with it. He talks to Bill Gates. He gets an offer from Bill Gates. He gets a lot of other offers from people. And no one, Jobs never said what he was doing. He never wrote down or told anybody why he did this. But Catmull's conjecture is that he wanted to verify that he was valuing the company right. So if Bill Gates offered him 20 million, then it's at least worth 30. I made the right play, uh, but you know that's conjecture. Who knows? Well, another thing that happens now is they expand their software offering. They create the computer animated production system and sell it to Disney, and this is huge. So Disney hadn't had. We're now 30, 30 years since 101 Dalmatians. No major tech jumps at Disney, and Caps allows the artists to paint and manage animation cells uh, instead of by hand. They can do it in the computer now. And the first film to use this is the last sequence of the Little Mermaid, uh, and this allowed for um, transparency and things like that. So the whole rainbow and all that kind of everything you can see through it, that was all done in caps. Uh, and this, this kind of leads into the second golden wave of Disney animation. You know, you end up after Little Mermaid, you got Beauty and the Beast, you got Aladdin, you got the Lion King, all these things that, that were able to happen. Some of it came from the, you know, the people that were working there, but also the technology is moving forward and allowing them to tell stories in different ways. <clears throat> 1991. Disney comes knocking, says, we want to do an animated feature. They were talking, like, maybe, you know, hey, maybe we could get John Lasseter. Not, we can you know, they try to hire John Lasseter away. They maybe will buy your technology. Uh, and this is the Jobs reality distortion field. And it's just one of those things you kind of be like, how did this work? But it did. Steve Jobs tells Katzenberg, nope, you're not getting my tech. You're not getting my people. We'll do a three-picture deal, and all you get is the finished film. And he said, okay. And that's where it worked. 1993, in parallel to them working on this first feature, the, uh, they have packaged the Reyes algorithm into a pro piece of software now called RenderMan. And RenderMan wins the technical Oscar. Um, the, these were becoming industry standard tools very quickly. Nobody could render stuff the way RenderMan did. Terminator 2 is an example. All of the weird, bulbous, uh, mercury-based kind of the thing of the T2000 for the uh, um, a T25, I'm sorry, were, um, were, done on, um, were done on RenderMan. And here you can see the guy's reflection in, in, in the, the metal and stuff. I mean, that's all done in the computer in post. Uh, Beauty and the Beast was entirely colored in caps. So uh, RenderMan wins the technical Oscar this year and Toy Story is in full production, but it's not the Toy Story we know. Uh, Disney execs have been, have been reviewing the story and they've been doing storyboards and they've been giving notes. Notes is basically you, you play the film, they tell you what they think and you keep going back and forth. November 19th, 1993 is what Pixar refers to as Black Friday. Um, they flew down and showed the most recent reel. It was a disaster. And uh, this hadn't been seen until the recent re uh, Blu-ray release of Toy Story. And they put this on. And it's, it's amazing to watch and, and kind of understand um, the finished products we see are never how things start. So let's watch this. This is the reel that we showed on Black Friday for Holy We Envision. Woody's character. It's, um, you know, it's bad. You know, <laughs> it's really bad. Um, it's kind of rough to watch these days. But uh, hey, for history's sake, I think it's important to see, you know. Um, so uh, this takes place right before they go to Pizza Planet. And all of the other toys are placing bets just to, to, to see who Andy's going to take, either Woody or Buzz Lightyear. Woody, ah, ah, I'd just like to wish you luck. I, I, I know you'd do the same for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whoa! Oh! What? 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 What are you? What's everybody looking at? What? Hey, he slipped. I tried to. He, I couldn't hold that. It was an act. He slipped. I think he fell off of the street. Get a drug deal. <laughs> he ain't going to pizza now. Woody, you deliberately threw Buzz out the window. Oh, you play well. Cowboy, where is your honor, dirtbag? You are an absolute disgrace. You don't deserve to wear a 10-gallon hat on your pipe-sized head. Men, search and rescue. I want to... 
Another minute back, team on the double. Hustle up. Move it, move it, move it. Move it. Move it. Move it. Move it. Move it. Spike for brains. That's what do you think you're doing? Off the bed. Hey, off the bed. You're going to make us what he? No. He is. Slinky. Slink. Slink. Slinky. Get up here and do your job. Are you deaf? I said take care of that. Uh, I'm sorry, Woody, but I have to agree with them. I don't think what you did was uh, right. What? Am I hearing correctly? You don't think I was right? Who said your job was to think, Spring Wiener? Well, I, I just, just thought that you... Just that reserve of brain power to consider this for a moment. If it wasn't for me, Andy wouldn't pay any attention to you at all. In fact, my tricky friend, you would have been hauled away to Goodwill a long time ago, so shut your mouth and get them off the bed. Do it. Now, Slink, or I'm throwing you off. You're going to have to throw the two of us off. Make that three. Count me in. No, Woody. You get your butt off the bed. I, I, I don't believe this. <laughs> are, are you are you threatening me? Yeah. Get off the bed, ranch hands, or we're throwing you off. <laughs> You and what army? Here he is, that dirtbag bragging! Move, move, move! Take no prisoners! So that's pretty dark. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So what happens is Katzenberg basically says, This is wrong, wrong, wrong. We are not, this is not the movie we want to be making. What's happening? You know, they shut down production and, and until you can fix the script. Um, but what's hilarious is they got to this point because the Disney execs keep saying, you need to make him edgier, you need to make him harder, you know, and so Pixar was trying to respond to their feedback and not go with their gut. And they made this obviously horrible version of a movie that we love. And uh, when Katzenberg asked one of his people what happened, the guy's like, well, they were doing what we told them to. They weren't making the movie they wanted to make anymore. So Lasseter says, give us two weeks, we'll turn it all around. Because at that point, they were ready to like lay off everybody. Like Disney was like, we're done. And so they come back in and they basically have the brain trust. And the brain trust gets together. And we'll talk about them in a little bit. And they completely re-storyboard the film, rewrite the film from scratch, do their whole thing. And <clears throat> they end up with the movie now that we, you know, pretty close to the movie we know. Um, so for us, you kind of have to go down these rabbit holes, right? You need to be seeing, instead of seeing something as a failure, it's R&D, it's learning. We're improving things as we go. And the important quote here in, uh, is protect the future, not the past. So we need to make these safe environments where we can go and make these mistakes and find these things out and be like, that was bad. That was not where we should have gone. Um, and so now obviously we've got four, four Toy Story movies and they're all pretty incredible. And I don't think you, if you told me when Toy Story 1 came out, they're gonna be four and they're all gonna be good. I'd be like, no, there's no way. But they're there. So uh, the way out is through the creative craft is, is kind of the learning here. And also take advice, but always trust your gut and your team to make the story product you know you need to make. Um, you see this a lot when you're venture funded. You get a lot of people telling you what you should do and how you should be and what you should be thinking about. And a lot of those things, sometimes you got to be like, okay, that's, that's valid. And sometimes you'll be like, that's a horrible idea. We're not going to do that. And so the team came together, fixed those problems became the brain trust. Uh, and we'll hit, come back to this in a little bit. 1995, Toy Story is gonna be released. And in another Jobs moment, a brilliance, he decides to IPO Pixar the opening weekend of Toy Story. So they double their value overnight. Uh, and it's, uh, it's one of those things where you're just kind of like, all right, he knew what he was doing. Um, he knew that, Jobs kind of knew that he had to set the company up in a different way. He knew that Disney, Toy Story was gonna be a hit. And he knew that he had to set the company up because Disney was going to come knocking to renegotiate. And sure enough, Michael Eisner called up, said, I want to talk, you know, renegotiate the deal. And at this point, Pixar, because of that IPO, didn't need Disney's money. They had the cash on hand. So they were negotiating from a position of power and Eisner knew it and Jobs knew it. So Jobs is like, this is what you get. This is what we get. And Eisner was pretty much like, great, done. So... One of those things, you know, Jobs was the 70% holder of Pixar stock. So he pretty much was, a, you know, a loan operative. It didn't really matter what anyone else said. But this is also how later in about four or five years, Jobs becomes one of the largest shareholders of Disney. 
So when you have a win, leverage it <laughs> and uh, always negotiate from a position of power. Like if you think about it, this like how we, we are, you know, it's, it's one thing, you know, when you have a win as a product team, but also if you're going to be um, the most valuable day for you to an employer is the day before you sign your employment agreement. <clears throat> That's when you can negotiate the minute you're, you're in, then it's like, you can't really negotiate the same way. So that's your position to power. You kind of have to think of things in that way. So moving on into people and candor, history lesson is done. So I'm fascinated with origin stories and that was a fun one to go through, but how does that turn into us working? So candor, what is candor? Uh, as opposed to, as opposed to honesty really is kind of the, 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 the two things we're holding up here. Honesty can have a negative connotation. You, that person was way too honest with me, right? Um, it's, it's easy to be too honest, but it's more difficult to be too candid. <clears throat> so it's, it's about, I mean, honest is part of the definition, but it's, it comes across in a different way to be, to be candid with somebody. So an example that happened at the end of Toy Story, unit production managers, the PMO from our world, um, you know, they were kind of grumbling that they were second-class citizens on the production under the animators and, and other people, but they hadn't said anything during production because the the kind of Hollywood mentality is you don't rock the boat in production, you just get it done. Um, but rumors started circulating, people were unhappy, people wanted to leave. And once Ed heard about that, he called in the UPMs and said, what is going on? Um, and so they had an open door policy, but it was, uh, obviously wasn't interpreted in the right way. So they reinforced open door policy, doesn't matter where we are in production, you always come and tell us what's going on. <clears throat> and so this comes out as a great quote, if there's more truth in hallways than in meetings, you have a problem. Um, and it's also about the means of feedback. It's not, you can be better, it's this can be better. And let's work on this together. And a great example from working in tech that I have is I did a bunch of work with Amy Hoy at Guggenheim Securities. Uh, and before that was Bear Stearns. Um, and that the, the team lead there, a guy named Jonathan Summer was awesome. And he was a uh, developer himself. Uh, I'd come from a development background but we're all sitting there working on financial software. And whenever we'd pop up a screen or a design or a UX thing, if he didn't care for it or it wasn't right, he would, he would always start the critique with, I love you, I don't love this. Um, but it immediately deflated the, the mental game that a lot of us will have to deal with where it's like, if somebody critiques our work negatively, they're critiquing us. So he, he knew whatever that was, he diffused that, moved right on. And it was a great, lesson in how to help manage people and, 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 you know, name the thing that we're working on as opposed to like being nebulous and, and causing stress. Um, this came out in a bigger way at Pixar. They, they created something called notes day. So we talked about notes before where Disney was giving notes to a production. So notes happen all the time during production, but they implemented a retrospective for lack of a better word, um, where notes were given, you could give a note about anything. You didn't like the food or, but it was, it was always like, as opposed to saying, I don't like the food. It's like, could we improve this by doing blah? It was always in a way of let's give feedback and try and improve things as opposed to complaining. <clears throat> Jobs is notorious also at this time for going into Pixar and just walking into screenings and meetings, pointing at random people and saying, what's one good thing about Pixar? And then pointing at somebody else and saying, what's one bad thing about Pixar? And all those things that came out as what were bad things about Pixar were shuttled over to be repaired or fixed. Um, so there was, there was definitely a lot of that kind of like, but it was this thing of like, the guy asked me what a bad thing was. I can't say nothing because that's a lie. So here's the bad thing about Pixar. And then that they would come back and fix it. This is building an environment. This is building a feeling. Um, it's, it's creating this, you know, this culture of feedback that's accepted and encouraged and, and really important to, to have a successful creative group work together on an ongoing basis. So this is a long quote, but, um, as we're looking at working in teams too, big projects, we can get bogged down. We can get really much, uh, really down in the weeds, get the blinders on and being able to pull people back up and see the forest for the trees and uh, is crucial in the product life cycle. Uh, this would happen with directors. They'd get so far down in there, they were getting stuck on one or two shots as opposed to saying, oh, here I am and here's the story and here's the arc and here's how we can make this work. So this is where the brain trust really came in and it started to become part of the daily life of Pixar production. And it's a rotating group of individuals, all of whom are considered amazing storytellers in the, in the company. Um, and the goal is to 
get the best story and fix the issues before it's been animated, before it's been edited. So this is what we're still drawing storyboards. We're still stepping through the story. Um, they have no power to mandate. The director can ignore their suggestions, but uh, it's effectively peer review. Uh, there have been examples where somebody got stuck, like a director just couldn't get out of the rut they were in and they would swap out directors. But this, this is really the way, I mean, their goal here is to improve the story and make the story as the best it could be. In our world, you know, the, the pull request peer review workflow, you know, sometimes people do have the power to mandate in a PR and be like, hell no, I'm not merging this. Uh, but, uh, you know, the goal is lots of eyes and lots of ideas and lots of viewpoints coming together. So trying to get a disparate group of, of reviewers, like don't just get the same two people every time, like go out there and find disparate points of view, get someone who's never looked at this part of the code before, uh, come in and, and, and ask the questions that may just seem like things that no one talked about, but you know, that fresh set of eyes will ask the beginner questions that need to be asked. Um, and, and also the concept here of a co-director. So if you're on, a, if you're a team lead, like, you know, if your strengths are one, two, and three, and someone else's are four, five, and six, you know, become co-leads. The same thing they're doing here. So it's basically filling in each other's weaknesses. The end goal is a better product. So it's also a way that you can mentor up somebody too. Like, you know, if, if, um, if you're, a, you're, a, you're a team lead right now and you know you're gonna be moving out to somewhere else or you're gonna be taking on a different project or you're gonna be leaving the company, I mean, it happens, we all move on at, at different points. Being able to mentor someone up so that team is able to execute when you leave is also crucial. So find a way to build a brain trust, however you need to name it, build it around how your team works. Um, and you know, also let's talk about fear. <clears throat> People can't step out of their lane if that exists as a, a concept and kind of an understanding. Uh, that can be very, very dangerous. Um, it's one thing to be fearful of, of, you know, like, oh, the CEO doesn't like popcorn to be popped uh, or something along those lines. But it's uh, when somebody can't make a suggestion because they get slapped down by another team, that's that's a bad thing. So, for example, a uh, real story from, from recently that I was dealing with earlier this summer, I'm working on a project and I'm throwing up ideas and discussing stuff. And somebody's like, oh, well, that's a big hit on the database okay can we cache it is it something that's it's is it a static call yeah do we have caching yeah why don't we cache it i don't care how you cache it you could use redis you could do something else but the the point was is like you know is there a solution <laughs> and this is the thing this is a ux we do this all the time the five whys why why you be that petulant child that has to know why but this comes from lean the the lean process and the toyota production system you ask why five times you usually will get to the root of the problem so you just keep chipping away at it and again this is not a personal thing this is a we can make the pro okay yeah a long database call stinks that's horrible nobody likes that you got to wait so can we cache that can we return it in 10 milliseconds instead of 10 seconds if the answer is yes why aren't we doing that you know is what's what's the blocker and, and you know especially coming in when you're a new person or you're not in the group that's had to make some decisions to get there you can ask those questions and it's like i just don't know tell me talk to me explain to me why we got there um you can encourage people to rubber duck through whatever problem they're doing and often you know some, and sometimes kind of throw back ideas and say hey what about this have you thought about this and it's, it's it's always good to ask questions as opposed to giving dictation uh or what happens when blank that's a great construct to use um so this is not just as like people on the product team. This is that you can have a great idea come from someone in accounting. You can have a great idea come from somebody. Uh, the example Ed Catmull uses is the janitor should feel free to put out an idea. Um, so you never discount where ideas are coming from. Always, always try and look at the idea. And you know, if fear is there, it's going to destroy candor and collaboration. So you need to figure out a way to get rid of it. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Something else here that we're looking at is the um, getting the ideas out of people. Because sometimes everyone's work, you feel like we're working great together, and um, but but the communication is not happening. Like the the ideas aren't moving around, and so finding ways to facilitate uh, people providing feedback and ideas to each other is important. And this is an it's not necessarily just a formal process; it's also an informal process. And one thing they did is Pixar University. And the concept here was cross-pollination. So you're gonna get, you know, we're gonna do a pottery class, but I've got an animator, I've got an accountant, I've got a layout artist who's doing the environment layout and, and creation. Uh, you know, I've got a story person over here, a story editor, and they're gonna be sitting there working on pottery, but they're gonna be talking about what they're working on. 
Uh, and, and we'll get to some other crosstalk solutions that, that Pixar has implemented when we talk about the architecture space. Uh, but that's another way, like figuring out ways for people to collaborate and talk. So it's also now, oh, I went to that pottery class with that person. Now I can go over and talk to her and I'm not like random, you know, person that's like throwing an idea at an animator that doesn't know them. It's like, hey, what's up? Hey, what are you working on? I had an idea about that thing we talked about. Start to get that kind of stuff working. So looking again at Pixar's RenderMan, 27 of the last films to win the visual effects Oscar use RenderMan. Uh, this is a technology that is a node-based piece of software. It used to be written by hand. This used to literally be more akin to uh, a high-level basic or something like that, where every single piece was typed out. Um, this is a shader algorithm. On the right-hand side, this blue box is the final piece, and this is just a skin shader. This is one of many shaders that would go onto a character. Um, we have all sorts of different things here. We have a displacement, which is going to give you a 3D effect on the, the texture. Um, there's some other things that are called out here and you can kind of see this is this appears to be the skin shader used for the head of a character. Um, <clears throat> but all of these things are are drawn. So instead of now having to type this by hand, now there's tools that let artists drag and drop and connect nodes together. And this really speeds things up from a, a build perspective. You're not dropping into writing software as a creative person. Uh, and if you think about what the computer is calculating at the end of the, the shot, where you have that final shot, it's rendering tons of passes. So each one of these is called a render pass. You know, beauty, Z depth here, uh, ambient, uh, which is just the ambient light without any of the feature light, ambient occlusion, where you get like those are kind of natural shadows, um, where when you get into cracks and crevices and, and there's a shadow, but it's not really a shadow that's cast in the sense of like a spotlight. Um, like shadow raw is more of that kind of thing, or diffuse, you can see some of that shadow in diffuse raw too, or the, the pure shadow pass here in the bottom right. So these things all start to add up and they get layered together. And the beauty shot is effectively the finished shot as the computer rendered it. But what they'll do is they'll take all these things into the computer again and tweak each one of them to make that final pass. And that's called compositing. So <clears throat> to think about this, on the top is Toy Story 1, on the bottom is Toy Story 4. That is not a photograph, that's a render. Uh, it's 25 years of, of software development right there is what that is. What that is. Uh, and some people have joked that it looks like, what do you got a facelift? But again, Toy Story 1 to Toy Story 4. Um, the, the view that we have up top is kind of what the artist's real-time view looks like now. It, it doesn't have the environment in the back, but that's what the computer and the graphics cards can handle in real time now. So, you know, every, every time when they're working on something, they're coming up with something new, like, you know, the fur shader from Monsters, Inc. is going to come back in. And I mean, you look at the hair detail here, it's like a block in the top and you've got follicles of hair reflecting light, having light pass through them, it looks like real hair. And this is the kind of stuff that over time we get better and better and better. And again, going back to the short, this is Piper that was done maybe about a year, year and a half ago. The photorealism levels are getting to the mind boggling point. Um, it's, uh, it's just, it's an incredible tech. And so this tech, you know, is something they share with the world. Like right now I can go download RenderMan for free. I can use it. I can make stuff for myself. Don't have to pay a penny. Um, you know, they also sell render farm versions and stuff like that to studios for lots of money. But um, they're build, you know, they're building the tool they need to tell a story and letting everyone else use it as well. Uh, and that's that's something powerful. Um, so you can go out and play with it right now in Maya or Nuke or any of those programs, and and it's great. Another thing that that they do, this is from Coco. They do research trips. <clears throat> Our research is crucial to our storytelling. And with Coco, we have to visit a beautiful country of Mexico. This movie, you want it to all be rooted in actual places and actual people. So it was really important to us to see kind of the breadth of Mexico and how many different cultures and traditions there are. We visited big cities and little towns, multi-generational family businesses of shoemakers for art for story and characters. It was just so informative. We were experiencing the colors and the smells and the sights and this incredible food. Have some more. Look at this. See? <laughs> That's what I thought you said. The beautiful architecture, the papel picado, the alabrijes, all of that is brought into the film in all these different ways. And those early research trips not only inspired the look, but they inspired the story and the importance of family. 
So if you look at that, you know, there's no way to replace research. There's nowhere to replace immersive research, especially um, if, you, if you're not doing up research up front, you end up with a lot of assumptions and they're often wrong. Uh, you're going to have product issues when you do that. So go to where people are. If you're developing a transportation app for your metro area, for example, doing research on how someone uses their phone in a quiet lab in a room is not a real good analog to life. They are probably sitting there at a bus stop trying to scroll through and see when the next bus is coming. Their kid may be grabbing on their shirt saying, I want something, give me a snack. You know, there's a lot of ambient noise. There's people, there's other cars moving. They're looking to see if the bus is coming. A um, lot more happening there than, than just in the lab looking at my screen. Um, likewise, uh, another example, weather apps. For those of you who aren't familiar, Dribble with two, the three Bs is a site where designers post screenshots of stuff. And no idea why, but everybody and their brother seems to have wanted to design a weather app. They're all awful because each one is very pretty and shows beautiful clouds and has 72 degrees written on it, you know, and, but that's not what people are necessarily looking at. What every time my wife in the morning asks, what's the weather? She needs to know, is it raining today? And what do I need to put the kids in? That's, the, that's the question is in her head. The question she says is, what's the weather today? So if you think about dark sky, dark sky is a great example of that. Here's your temperature. Here's the high today. Here's the next hour. And then here's the day by the hour, what you can expect. That is a far better experience. It doesn't have all the pretty graphics and craziness and colors, but it's, that's a good experience. So think about that. Like this is why we do the research up front. This is why we test things. This is why user testing is so crucial to product development. Uh, let's move into part three, making spaces. And we're not making this an HGTV show, but it's just as much fun. Um, so like I said, I came from architecture and uh, I spent a lot of time studying what are good and bad spaces uh, and still kind of is like a pet habit of mine. And so I'm fascinated with how do you encourage creativity in a space? This is not it. This is the Social's old office in downtown DC. It was a miserable place to work. And I'm sorry for anybody who is a former coworker of mine who liked this this from your prerogative, but uh, this is an open office, hard ceilings, hard floors, hard walls. Uh, it was cacophonous and loud. Half the floor was sales and the other half was in engineering. Uh, so all the engineers had noise canceling headphones on trying to block out the noise that was being created by sales and sales admin running on the phones trying to make money for the company, which is important, but uh, it was not a good collaborative experience. Um, and this is, you know, office, open offices have, you know, we're all the rage, but it's finally becoming something where people are like, yeah, this sucks. This is horrible. No one likes to work in them. So looking at Pixar's space, the, um, this is the Pixar campus in Emeryville, California, which is, you know, East Bay near Oakland. And the main building, we're going to see a lot of pictures from the main building and a little bit of one of the secondary buildings, uh, which is this bottom left-hand building right here. But um, Steve Jobs was basically the, you know, <clears throat> designer client so he's working with the architect and basically dictating this is what ha has to happen. Um, and one of his directives was there should only be one bathroom in the middle of the building. Um, and like, okay, why? Again, this is why you ask why, right? So, well, everyone will run into each other that way. They all have to talk to each other if they all have to go to the bathroom in the same place. Okay, there's an in interesting, good intent, horrible implementation. Thankfully, there's more than one bathroom in the building. But uh, the point here is looking at the system. So once we look at how they've broken down this building, this is the, the building in the bottom left, which is like a, a microcosm of the main structure. Same, same organizational concept. You've got your entryway here on the right, uh, like it's like a big porch, and you go into this large atrium space. And in here you have you know, your access to your theaters, your kitchen, your cafe, your mail, a game area, kind of relaxation. They call it the street. Uh, and then as you go off into more private spaces, you move into team areas, collaborative work areas, conference rooms and things like that, and then into offices. There are some spaces for cubes, but most of this is collaborative workspace. Um, this is in the main structure here. On the bottom, you're looking at the street and the cafe, and on the, the second floor here, you're looking at uh, conference rooms off a very large hallway. Uh, and that, this is that hallway. This is not a hallway that is meant only for traffic. This is a hallway meant for meetings. This is a hallway meant for stopping. This is a hallway meant for collaboration to the extent that they've even have seating areas in the hallway. Um, that, yeah, it's uh, most, most, if you think about most tech buildings, the hallway is nothing to talk about. It's as boring and bland as you get and it gets you from point A to point B. Uh, but having huge, like this is almost a 10 foot hallway or it is a 10 foot hallway, honestly. Um, 
you know, that's that space wants to be occupied and used. Uh, and also they give every uh, every animator gets a budget to swank out their own 10 by 10 space and the team areas get the treatment too. So, um, you know, this, you know, two different spaces here, the team area kind of with uh, some people's offices off of it. And then here's somebody else's, you know, animation suite here on the left. Uh, and even when you get into like the cube quote unquote area, this is, you know, still somebody's made like a house they get they can shut a door and they can keep the door open and it's like their area and you know you got bigger suites too where you got like an edit suite where you need a lot more work and you have people reviewing the work but it's still something where it's like their space and so office design can encourage collaboration or can hinder it um so oh but we can't do that in tech companies right wrong fog creek software new york city uh, Fog Creek has been, this is the second big office that they've actually talked a lot about this. And they did another one was, was a much smaller office also in New York. Um, and they have kind of been thinking about this problem for a while. So developers have a door with an office, uh, a, an office with a door that they can close. Um, and, uh, but this space is not just for developers. This space supports sales. This uh, it is um, for meetings with investors and clients and all sorts of things. So the personal offices are really for standalone work, but the desks are also large enough to easily enable pair programming. <clears throat> Workstations down here, you know, on the right, kind of this open area are for, for commuters or people that come in and work for a couple hours to do something. Uh, and you can do co, again, they're wide enough to enable co-working or pairing, but they're also fine if you're just gonna work by yourself. We got phone booths, which, which are literally like mini quiet cars. You've got a large conference room slash quiet car. Um, and it can be used, you know, across a lot of different work modes. Uh, it's flexible. It's experimental. It's something that, that allows for people to do different things, but also doesn't force interaction in a certain way. So this is, you know, this isn't a huge office. This isn't a campus like Pixar, right? This is something manageable here. Uh, this is something that a lot of medium-sized companies or tech startups could easily do if they decided to do it. So the environment, this is one of my pet peeves coming out of architecture, lazy or crap office design. So much of it is just like, oh, just throw people in there and it'll be fine. And it can really destroy collaboration and good work environment. So in fact, you know, getting a good environment affects the productivity and happiness, so fix it. And I guess worst case, go grab some two by fours, pop up some walls over the weekend and see what happens. <laughs> Beg forgiveness later. <laughs> it's, it may be worth it. Um, and again, if this has been interesting to you, this is the tip of the iceberg as far as what Ed Catmull goes into in this book. I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing book. He, uh, this is a, his thesis of over 40 years of creative management. And, you know, as an engineer, coming as an engineer and a software developer and a storyteller, it's a really fascinating look at how we can improve our workspaces, the way we collaborate and the way we build things. So uh, also we've got, uh, I'm working on a thing called Developer UX. If you're interested, go take the quiz and sign up to be notified. It's UX for developers. So. So that's what we got. Very cool. Yeah, I read that book a long time ago, Creativity Inc. That was a, or I listened to it, Audible. Yeah. That was a well worth my time. Um, very cool insight into all their processes. And you just scratched the surface with this, with this. Right. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. There's, it's like every page, there's something else on there. You're like, wow, wow. Exactly. Um, all right. So anyone in chat, if you have any questions, now's the time. This is wrong. Um, so to kill some time during the delay. Uh, so we we're, I asked the crowd, what was your favorite Pixar short? Oh, nice. Um, I like one of my favorites is the, one of the newer ones, uh, Bo with the, the little dumplings. Like I, I like just out of nowhere. <laughs> right. and it's like that entire story. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Joel was saying he liked lava. I really liked lava too with that the volcanoes. That was really well done. Um, and it's really cool to watch the shorts and go. So, what's this practicing for for the next movies? Like, right? Um, I, I forgot what shorts it is, but you can go back and say, "All right, this is a short where they were practicing humans uh, or um, rendering humans so they could make." Um, not like inside out, but maybe like the next toy store or something a little bit better. It's right. like, oh, they're going to prominently feature um, better rendered people in in the next uh, next cartoon or then totally. the next next animation. 
Oh. Very fun. Let's see. Always fun, yeah. yeah I love uh, parties. I mean, they're they're all great for different reasons. I love Party Source Rex. That's a pretty fun one. Yeah. Uh, I just I just was reminded of that one recently, and I went back and rewatched it. I was like, oh yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's classic. <laughs> And I, I need to go back and watch. They have the collections now where yeah. you can just get nothing but the shorts. Yep. And I think there's like some of the shorts three, you can't easily get. Three Blu-rays now, I think. Something like that. What was that? I think there's like three Blu-rays now of just the shorts. I think they're up to that many. And they're all good all on their own. <laughs> right? <laughs> so good. Yeah. And it's like, it's the best part about seeing a Pixar movie in the theater. Is the it's short. like, all right, get there early because I want to see the short. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and it's always nice to not have as much uh, trailer. <laughs> so yeah. Cool. All right. Well, chat's being a little quiet. We've had a good crowd. Um, I've been watching the numbers. So, but uh, everyone's quiet right now, which is not a big deal. You don't have to say anything. But John, all your information's up on the screen, and this is going to be on YouTube for all eternity. Um, so, if anyone wants to talk to John later, uh, you have his information. Well, with that, John, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Thank you for having me. Good to see you again. Yeah. All right. I have stopped the recording, but the show still goes on. We're still live. So <laughs> um, we'll call this the after show. Hang out yeah. for a minute or two. Yeah, I always like that talk because I, I love the Pixar history. Like there's so much that go. There's just so much that happened at the you right time. I don't even time. realize it. Like all the tech that, that those guys invented. Yeah. And I love that box, uh, the, the Pixar imaging computer. Yeah. Like, that is just a cool looking piece of machinery. I mean, it's a huge paperweight now, but it probably, you probably still, like, if you could even find one, it probably still sells for like $10,000. It's like just a, a weird artifact of <laughs> early computing, right? We only made so many of them, so they're worth something. Right. I, I guarantee there's some guys sitting on like four of them in, in, uh, in the Pixar employee stash. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, I don't think you mentioned this, but like, uh, render man is freely accessible now. Like anyone can go yeah. get a license for it. Yeah. Um, or it's a free, there's a free license and then you could always pay for the, the bigger, better features. Well, no, it, it's, it's fully featured, which is, this is so amazing. It's, it's fully featured for non-commercial work. Gotcha. Okay. So that, I mean, first of all, their attitude is, well, if you learn it and use it, you, we've got another render man user out there. Thumbs up. Yeah. You know, it's it's also just this thing of like being, you know, for years I was trying to get my hands on Render Man when I was doing like, because like this is back when renders like Mental Ray was the bomb and yeah, it was yeah. still kind of, <laughs> and so it was like, can I get Render Man? And like, of course, everyone's got a hacked version or something and something. And of course I was on a Mac and they had a version for Mac, but it was like OS 9 <laughs> or something like that like you know it was old school and so yeah you had to wait a while like they finally came back out with all this stuff you're like oh shoot okay oh I I've never downloaded I've thought about downloading it giving it a try just to see if I could figure out what like how to just make something simple render well the cool um, thing is you can still do the you can still write the shaders in manual code gotcha so you can just like sphere and, and translate the sphere and do all this stuff in, yeah. in just code. So it's like, it, I mean, it's, it is software. It's, a, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's not really real time because you're, you have to hit render each time, but it's, it's like a real time graphics environment is kind of the way to think about it. Yeah. I mean, I'll go write the next toy story and uh, I'll have like the old fashioned Andy, like that looks super creepy walking around. <laughs> as long as it's not, the script is important, man. Our script is important, right? None yeah, of that. Really. I'm amazed. I mean, like, credit to Tom Hanks that he was just like, yeah, this is what you want. This is what I'll give you. I'm amazed that, like, in Toy Story, like, three and four, um, not so much four, but three, when they're showing like new, like, new old Andy and, um, and they're in the house. Yeah, I always wanted to see like baby pictures of Andy of the old polygon <laughs> like, Andy, <laughs> up on the wall. It's like, man, I was an ugly child. Right? <laughs> you know, there probably is something like there are so many Easter eggs on the walls and on the bookshelves and stuff. They really like there's a lot of stuff they slipped in there. So much opportunity to just have like old polygon Andy on the wall and go. Right? That would have been pretty wow. good. <laughs> but, I really uh, smoothed out. Oh. Yeah, you you really you grew into your face, Andy. Good for you. 
<laughs> but it's like Buzz and Woody basically look I not identical. I mean, they look better now, but it's it was not just so much easier for them to render those cartoonish looking characters back then. Totally. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, the chat is quiet, so I don't want to take up any more of anyone's time. But, uh, John, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Thanks for having me, Kevin. And I will – well, I'll chat with you later, John. We're, we're always talking. So. <laughs> All, right. All right, everyone. Ta- have fun. Take care. Have a good one.